Amen and praise the Lord. It is so good to see you here today at Quail Springs Baptist Church. And I want you to take your Bibles. If you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me in the Old Testament to the book of Psalms. And if you'll find your way to Psalm 32, Psalm 32 is going to be our text for today. And, uh, you know, the Bible says that the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And one of the things that I did really over a year ago was to plan everything that, that I felt that the Lord was leading me to preach for, uh, for our church in the coming year. And so I've got plans laid out for all the way through the end of this year and into 2025. And I just thought I was going to get to, to, to preach those plans. I was so excited about them. But the Bible says that the heart of a man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. And the Lord has surprised us by uh, directing our steps in a direction that we were not expecting. And so today is my last day serving as your pastor. We're going to miss you tremendously. And, uh, and we, we just thank God for you. But I wanted to bring you a message from a series that I had planned uh, that was going to begin this summer. And, uh, and that, that series is called Cloud and Fire, How Our Good God Guides Us. I want to talk to you today about how God guides us. Our time here at Quell Springs has been an incredible time for us. We've made so many wonderful dear friends in this church. This is a sweet, loving fellowship of believers unlike any that we've been a part of. And we thank God for that. I want to tell you how thankful I am for our church staff here at Quell Springs. In every regard, God has blessed this church with, I believe, the greatest staff in all of the United States of America. I praise God for them. And I praise the Lord for Brother Lance and the way he leads us in worship. Church family, will you express your appreciation to Lance? And man, I just thank God for him. And um, he and I have talked about it so many times. God has just used him in, in incredible ways. To, to bring a spirit of freedom and joy and celebration and, uh, and, and Christ-centeredness to our worship here. And I praise the Lord for that. And I praise God for how God's used him. I praise the Lord for our executive pastor, Ray Griffin, and he's just a great friend and he loves you so much. And I'm thankful to God for him and for his leadership during the interim period, but also for his leadership every day, uh, the, the years I've served here. He's just been a great, great friend, a great leader to serve with. The thing that blesses me most about this church is that this church has a heart to reach people to follow Jesus Christ. Our mission, our vision is to lead people throughout the Oklahoma City Metro to follow Jesus as Lord. And that's a vision that I know God has given you because we're seeing people follow Jesus week by week by week. And praise the Lord for two more who today follow Jesus in believer's baptism. I believe there are incredibly bright days ahead for Quail Springs. I want you to know we're going to be praying for you. We thank God for you. And we're praying that God's just going to do great things as you follow Jesus together. I want us to look in the Word of God today in Psalm 32. We're going to talk about how our good God guides us. When Michelle and I were young parents, Joshua, our son, was maybe two, two and a half years old, and we moved to a new place right outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, we had a house that we loved, but there was a very unusual landmark just up the road from our house. And here's what it was. It was this huge steel man, this metal man. I mean, he was 20 to 25 feet tall and he stood out in a field by the side of the road and you couldn't miss him. Very unusual. First of all, just a huge man in the side, on the side of the road was an unusual thing to begin with. But the way he was put together, he had black boots, he had on blue bib overalls, he had on a red shirt, he had a black beard, a black mustache, thick black eyebrows, a black ball cap on. At one time you could tell he was holding something in his hand. Some people said that he used to hold uh, an ax in his hand. Some people said that he used to hold a muffler in his hand because he, he worked for, or he, he didn't really work, he's a giant man, mechanical man, or not a giant metal man, he didn't work for anybody, but he stood out in front of a muffler shop is what I heard, but they had moved into this field, 
And we would drive past him, and our son, two years old, absolutely loved that man. Every time we'd drive past him, he'd say, hey, big man. And it, when we first got there, he had a truck that was right, not a big truck, just a normal-sized truck. He had this truck that was right next to him, and something happened. They moved the truck, and so every time we drive past him after that, Joshua would say, hey, big man, where's your truck? He asked that question over and over again. The big man never answered any of these questions, but he always say, hey, big man. Well, we found out that that big man was a pretty good landmark for us when we were telling people how to find our house. We'd say, okay, if you'll go past the big metal man and about... Three roads past on the right, that's the road that leads to our house. And people say, big metal man. We say, you won't miss him. You'll see him. He's the big metal man. So we use him for directions that way. Or we tell people if they were coming the other way, listen, if you've driven past the giant metal man, they say, what? You'll see it. You'll know it when you see him. Well, if you've driven past the, the big metal man, you've gone too far. And so we used him for directions. I just bring that up to say this. There have been times in my life when I have wished that God would put a big metal man in the yard somewhere just to say, okay, this is the direction. This is, I want to get your attention. This is what I want you to do. But God doesn't always do that. Now, God has the ability to lead us and to direct us and to show us what he's doing in miraculous, unmistakable, big ways. The Bible tells us when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, they were traveling, journeying through the desert. There were no road signs. There were no streets. They're just going through the trackless desert. But on their way to the promised land, the Bible says that God led them supernaturally and unmistakably. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, the Bible says the Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar or a column of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And so as they were traveling through the wilderness, there was a constant, unmistakable, clear, miraculous, certain sign as to where they were to go. And sometimes we might ask, well, God, why can't you do the same thing for me? Why can't you guide me by a pillar of cloud and a pillar a fire. The truth is, though God does not use those same methods today, God wants to guide you. And God wants to guide me today just as much as he wanted to guide his people through the wilderness. But the truth is, even though they were guided by fire and cloud, if you read the book of Exodus, you'll see that the children of Israel still managed to mess it up. They managed to, to go in directions that God wasn't leading and doing things that God didn't want them to do. Here's what we see in the Word of God. When we as His people are ready to follow, our God is always ready to lead. Do you believe that this morning? Man, I believe that with all of my heart. When, when I'm ready to follow, when I'm well, ready to listen and to obey, when we're ready to follow, he is ready to lead. And so we come to Psalm 32. David wrote Psalm 32 after his sin with Bathsheba. If you look in the Psalms, you'll find two Psalms that David wrote in response to his sin with Bathsheba, the adultery and then the deception and then even murder that David fell into and plunged into as he walked away from God. In Psalm 51, we see David's prayer for forgiveness and deliverance because of his sin. But Psalm 32 is a prayer of thanksgiving and rejoicing before God because of what God had done to forgive him. Sin had taken David to places of compromise and deceit and hypocrisy and shame that David never would have imagined he would go. And yet he found God's restoration. He found God's forgiveness. And he discovered a new realization of God's unchanging hand guiding David's life. I want you to stand with me as we read God's word together. Psalm 32. We're going to read the last half of this psalm beginning in verse 6. Listen to what David writes. He says, Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. 
You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curved with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but the steadfast love, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. This is the word of God. Join with me as we pray together. Lord, we love you and praise you. I thank you for this good day that you've given us. Thank you for the joy of opening your word together. And Holy Spirit of God, we ask that you would speak to us today. Lord, move me out of the way and speak a word to your people today. God, show us how you desire to guide us as your people. And God, give us hearts that listen to you and follow as you lead. We'll give you glory and honor for all that you do. And Lord, I pray for those in this place today who have never trusted Jesus. Lord, show them right now how much you love them. Show them how much they need to be saved that today they might turn to Jesus and receive your gift of eternal life. We love you, Lord, and pray these things in Jesus' holy name. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. I want us to look at the verses we've read together. And I want to talk to you about three results of following God's guidance in our lives. Three results of following God's guidance in our lives. First of all, the Word of God shows us this. When God is our guide, He protects us. When God is your guide, He will protect you. Look in verses 6 and 7 of this text. And here David is speaking to God. And here's what he says. He says, therefore, let everyone who is godly, let everyone who has a heart for God offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. And David looks back on his life to a time when he was a very young man. In fact, not much more than a boy. He was a shepherd boy tending his father Jesse's sheep out in the wilderness. And he would be out in that place and it seemed calm and the skies were clear and everything was beautiful and the sheep were just doing their thing and he was watching them. It was great. And then all of a sudden, there was this downpour of rain and this storm suddenly came up on him so that all of a sudden, that little valley, that shallow valley, which they call wadis, that, that wadi where David was, became a torrential river flooded with, with rainwater and water coming off of the hills and mountains just flowing through that valley. And all of a sudden, David and his sheep were in danger and he needed a hiding place. He said, those who are godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me. You protect me. You take care of me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. David found himself in a place of danger where he needed shelter. He needed a hiding place. He found himself in trouble. He had experienced that as a young person when the, when the flood waters came, and then he had experienced it as an older person because of his own sin. When his sin became like a raging river that was going to sweep him out of the way. He said, God, I came to you and I called on you at a time when you might be found and you have been my hiding place. He came to God in prayer and God preserved David. The word of God says in Psalm 9 verse 10, those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. I remind you of my point. When God is our guide, he protects us. He never forsakes those who seek him. Bill Walton was a children's pastor at a church in Colorado Springs. And some years ago, there was a major drought in that area. As a result, there were a lot of forest fires. A friend noticed a fire that was burning on a mountain ridge above Bill's home. And Bill called 911 and they assured him it's under control but he was still restless. So Bill began to, 
to feel the Holy Spirit telling him he needed to do something, that he needed to evacuate his home. He phoned his friends and family. He emptied everything out of his home. But all the time that he was doing that, the the sheriff department and the fire departments were telling him, there's no danger, you can stay, that the fire's not gonna reach your house. By nightfall that Saturday night, the fire was on Bill's side of the mountain ridge. By nightfall, it was getting worse and worse. And so on that Sunday morning, he called other pastors at the church. And Bill said that he wasn't going to be able to be there because of the fire. He asked for the children in his children's ministry to pray for protection. The fire was burning quickly, up to 50 miles per hour. It came all the way down that mountainside, right up to Bill's house. There were temperatures up to 2,000 degrees. The fires burned within four feet of his house and then stopped. Here's what was amazing. The paint on his house wasn't damaged. He said later that even cobwebs underneath the eaves of his house all of them untouched, God answered prayers. Now, does God always work like that? No, but God always preserves. Sometimes he lifts you out of the flood or the fire. Sometimes he takes you through the flood or fire, but he will be with you. He is your hiding place and you can run to him. There's some people in this room today who need to call on God, just an SOS prayer, like David prayed. An SOS, just throwing up the flare and saying, God, I need you to do something for me. Maybe you need a hiding place in your family. Maybe your family is just out of control. Maybe your marriage is is just messed up and you don't know what's next. Or maybe your kids are going in a direction you never thought they would go in. God is your hiding place. He will protect you. As you follow him, maybe it's your finances. Listen, there's nothing wrong, nothing unspiritual about saying, God, here are my needs and I'm asking you to protect my finances. I'm asking you to take care of me. He is your hiding place. It may be your health. There's some people in this room, you're going through something in your body, some health issue, and and you don't know what you're going to do. And you just call out to God with an SOS prayer and say, God, I need you. He is your hiding place. He's your hiding place for your future. When we wonder what's next or what's going to happen or where we're going to go or what it's going to be like, we can call on him and seek him. And when he is our guide, he protects. When God is our guide, he protects us. Secondly, the Bible shows us this. When God is our guide, he leads us. He leads us. Now, I want you to look in your Bible in verses 8 and 9 of this psalm. And and you're going to notice something happening. In verses 6 and 7, David is speaking to God. He says, you are my hiding place. In verses 8 and 9, it's God speaking to David. It's God speaking to us. And so God begins to speak and he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. When God is our guide, he leads us. There are three words the Bible uses here in verse 8 to talk about God's leadership. First of all, I will instruct you. That word instruct is used in the Old Testament to talk about God's wisdom. Do you realize that as a follower of Jesus Christ, God's wisdom is always fully available to you? Wisdom is more than knowledge. Wisdom is more than experience. Wisdom is the ability to see your circumstance from God's perspective and to understand what God is doing when you don't understand what's going on. The Bible promises that when we call on God, he will always, always, always give us his wisdom. James chapter 1 verse 5 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and it says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him call on God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If any of you lacks wisdom, how many of you know sometimes you lack wisdom? I do. Yeah, sometimes I lack wisdom. Here's what God does. I have found that God will push me into a place where I don't know what to do, 
where I get beyond my own resources, my own ability to figure things out, so that the only thing I can do is what I should have done to begin with, and that's to call on God and to ask him for his wisdom. And he's already promised he will instruct me. He will give me the wisdom I need. And so he says, I will instruct you. And then he says, I will teach you in the way you should go. The word teach there is not just a word about giving information. It's not just a word about giving new data. It's a word that has to do with giving direction. In fact, it's the same word they use to talk about aiming and shooting a, an arrow. It, it, it means to be sent out in the right direction, released in the right direction. He says, I will teach you in the way you should go. And then he says, I will counsel you. I will guide you with my eye upon you. He's always paying attention. And when we simply listen to him, he'll instruct us, he'll teach us, he'll guide us, he'll counsel us in the way we should go. There was a man out swimming in a large lake at dusk. He was about 100 yards offshore. He was just paddling leisurely, having a good time, when a thick fog suddenly rolled in. All of a sudden, he couldn't see anything. He couldn't see the horizon. He couldn't see any landmarks. He couldn't see any lights. And for 30 minutes, he just splashed around in a panic. He would go one direction, then he'd lose confidence, and then he'd turn 90 degrees and start in another direction. He did that for 30 minutes. Finally, he began to hear voices calling from the shore. And he oriented himself toward those voices, and he swam toward the voices that he could not see, and he made it in safely. The Bible says, call on God, and he will guide you as you seek him. Listen to what the Bible says, what God says in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 16. He says, and I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light and the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do. God says, this is the kind of stuff I do. These are the things I do. And I do not forsake them. When you're in darkness, he'll guide you as though you were in light. When you're blind and you don't know the path in front of you, he'll take you down the path as though you knew every step of the way. He says, I do that kind of stuff. These are the things I do, God says. And he does not forsake his people. There's some people in this room today, and what God wants you to do more than anything else, and I don't know what your circumstance is, I don't know what it is that's facing you, but you feel like you're going into the future blind, and you wonder what you're going to do next. And God says, if you'll simply trust him, he will take you on the next steps you need to take. There's an ethicist named John Kavanaugh, and when he was a young man, he was trying to make some major life decisions. And he just didn't know what he needed to do. And so he, he did something drastic. He thought that if he would go to India and go to Calcutta and spend several months working with Mother Teresa in her ministry there, and she had an incredible ministry at that time. This is while, you know, she was still living and she was ministering. So he went to Mother Teresa's ministry. He spent three months there. And just serving the poor and doing things and thinking that somehow being there and doing that would give him direction about what he needed to do next. And he thought maybe he would be able to talk to Mother Teresa and she would give him some type of insight and supernatural wisdom that, that he didn't have. And so he eventually got to meet Mother Teresa. And she asked, how can I pray for you? And he said, I've, I've got these decisions to make. And she said, he said, I'd like you to pray that God would give me clarity. And she looked at him and said, no, I'm not going to pray for God to give you clarity. He'd been there for three months. He traveled a long way. He asked her to pray for clarity. He said, why won't you pray for clarity? She said, in all of the decades I've served God, he's never given me clarity once. So I'm not going to pray for God to give you clarity. She said, in fact, it may be that you're seeking clarity and, and you'll, 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 you're wanting clarity so much that you won't trust God because you don't have clarity. 
So she said, I'm not going to pray for God to give you clarity. I'm going to pray that God would give you grace to trust him. Now, with all respect to Mother Teresa, I believe that God can give us clarity. I I think there are times when God gives us clarity. I think it's good to pray for clarity. Nothing wrong with that. But I also believe this. We can substitute clarity for trusting God. There are going to be times when God won't make it clear. When you're just like what the Bible describes in Isaiah, you're, 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 you've got unfamiliar paths in front of you. It's like you're blind. The, the, the places are rough. And what God wants you to do is say, God, I will trust you to lead me even when it's not clear. And when you do that, he will guide you. When God is our guide, he leads us. The third thing I want you to see in this text, number three, When God is our guide, he surrounds us. When God is our guide, he surrounds us. Usually when you think about someone guiding you, it's someone out in front of you. But the Bible says that as our guide, God comes on every side of us. He surrounds us completely. Notice what the Bible says as we move into verses 10 and 11 of the text. Now remember, verses 6 and 7, it's David speaking to God. Verses 8 and 9, it's God speaking to God to David and to us. But then verses 10 and 11, it's David speaking to us about God. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David gave this testimony. Verse 10, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but the steadfast love, the faithfulness of God surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. David understood what that was like. He knew what it was like to be a wicked person. By the way, the word for wicked there is a Hebrew word that just means to break loose. You don't have to be what this world says is evil, nasty, or mean to be what the Bible says is wicked. All you have to do is break loose from what God wants, and the Bible calls it wickedness. The Bible says, many are the sorrows of the wicked. David said, I went down the path of wickedness. I I broke loose from everything I knew that was right. I broke loose from God and my sorrow was great. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. The Bible says that when you trust in God, when you look to him as your guide, his steadfast faithful, unfailing love surrounds you. God illustrated that geographically in where he placed the city of Jerusalem. The the geography of of the city of Jerusalem, where the temple would one day be uh, after David's time, the the temple in Jerusalem and, and the city of Jerusalem was on a mountain surrounded by mountains. Jerusalem sits on Mount Zion and it was surrounded by mountains. God did that as an illustration of how his love surrounds his people. The Bible says in Psalm 125 verse 2, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. He says, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love, just like the mountains surround Jerusalem, steadfast love surrounds the one who trust in the Lord. Now watch this, verse 11. He says, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. In my Bible, I've circled that word rejoice in verse 11 because it literally means to go around in a circle. It means to be so joyful over what God is doing that you're going around in circles. Now think about that. His steadfast love surrounds us as we follow him so that we can go around in circles and say, Lord, I see you there and I rejoice. And God, I see you working here and I rejoice. And God, I see you working here and I rejoice. And God, you're working here and I rejoice. And God, you're working here and I rejoice. And you're working here and I rejoice. In every direction I look, I see your hand at work, God, and I rejoice in every direction. Praise God for that today. He doesn't just go in front of you. He's on either side of you He's behind you, he's above you, he's beneath you. When God is our guide, he surrounds us. Everywhere we turn, 
we see his presence. Everywhere we turn, we can sense his eyes upon us. Everywhere we turn, we find his direction. In the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, God gave his people guidance through a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. Can I tell you something? He's given us something even better. He's given us himself. He's given us his perfect word inspired by the Holy Spirit that's a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. And he's given us his Holy Spirit who lives inside of us to direct us in the ways we should go. This week, I had breakfast with one of our students. And and as we were talking, we were just talking about how God leads and, uh, and, and he was asking me questions. How, did, how has God led you? He said, how did God lead you into ministry? And we talked about that. He said, well, how did God lead you to come to Quail Springs? And we talked about that. And how's, how's God leading you now to, to go to the next place, the next assignment as you move away from here? And we talked about that in my life. And then we talked about God's leading in his life. And one of the questions he asked is a question you probably asked. It's a question I've asked. How do I know that I'm following God's leadership and not just doing the thing that seems most attractive to me or seems best to me? How do I know that I'm following him? He asked that question. How do I know it's really God? How do I know it's not just me? And we talked about those things. And then after we finished up breakfast, we went out from the restaurant, and he said, hey, pastor, can, can you take me home? Because somebody had driven him and dropped him off at the restaurant. He needed a ride home. And I said, sure. So he jumped into the car, and I said, so where do you live? He said, well, if you go out from the parking lot, take a left here on Penn. And he said, go through this stoplight. And he said, go down to two streets up, take a, a left there. And we went into the subdivision. Then we got into the subdivision. And he said, okay, if you take a left here, he says, down this road. And, and then we went a little bit further. He said, you missed the house. I showed you where the, I'm directionally challenged. My wife will tell you I'm directionally challenged, even with somebody in the car with me. He said, you, you missed the, the, the turn. He said, turn around and you'll see the red car. That, that's where the house is. That's where I need to go. And I dropped him off and he got out of the car and I was hoping I could make it back to the church without anybody telling me how to get where I was going next. But as I was driving, I realized that what happened in that car ride is very, very similar to what happens in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ as he directs us. He doesn't just give us a map and send us out. He doesn't just tell us, okay, do this, this, this. He gets in the car with you. And through the relationship you have with him, he tells you what turns to take. He tells you what landmarks to look for. If you go past where he wants you to go, he says, hey, you missed it. You need to turn around. He guides us through the relationship that we have with him through his Holy Spirit who lives inside of us and through his word that speaks to us. And it's very, very simple. When the person riding with you knows where you need to go and you listen, he'll take you exactly where you need to go. Friend, that's true for me. That's true for you. You listen to him. You walk in a close relationship with him. And the Bible promises he will instruct you and he will teach you in the way you should go. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that today, church? Man, I believe that with all of my heart. Lord God, you've been so good to us. Lord, we've heard your voice speaking to us in this place today. Lord, you have met with us here by the power of your spirit. We thank you for that. And Lord God, I pray for my brothers and sisters across this room. Lord, by your spirit, move us out of the way so that we can reach people with the gospel. Lord, may we lay down our rights and our privileges and our comfort and our preferences. 
Help us to live our lives, to give our lives for the sake of reaching people with the gospel. Lord, use us to make a difference for you. And Father, we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Pastor Rummage, thank you for always being willing to move yourself out of the way and never making it about you. Thank you for laying down your rights, privileges, comfort, and preferences for the sake of reaching people with the gospel. And thank you for teaching us to do the same.